Welcome to Covenant Life Church of God. Thank you for joining us today as we grow in faith through the Word of God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for allowing us to be in your house today. Help us to receive all you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to have a time of prayer. And we have asked, um, we have four people that is going to lead us in prayer. And we're going to agree with them in prayer. Um, Betty will start with salvation and healing prayer for our nation. And then Cindy will follow with prayer for the sanctity of human life in our nation, which today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And then Sharon Yetzi will follow Cindy with prayer for revival, renewal, outpouring of Holy Spirit at Covenant Life. And then Brother Clifton will conclude with prayer for Pastor Dennis, an increase in wisdom, good health, and anointing from Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to enter a season of prayer right now. Amen. Good morning. Join in along with us as we, as we pray these prayers today. Pray it from your own heart and how the Lord leads you. But first of all, we're going to pray for the harvest in our nation. Father in heaven above, we stand in the gap praying for lost souls. Anyone who is not in you is lost. God, we made, you made each of us and it is your desire that none shall perish. You want everyone to be saved. In the name of Jesus, and by the blood of Jesus, I stand against the enemy. Satan, I demand you release the minds of the spiritually dead. Release their minds so they can understand the gospel. I pray the darkness around their minds would be lifted and they would see the light of the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray they would begin to see sin as God sees it, that they would know how disgusted he is by sin. They would be convicted, and they would seek freedom for their minds and their souls. In the name of Jesus, I pray that every seed that has ever been planted into those unsaved souls will begin this very moment to bring the harvest. I bind the enemy that keeps those minds and souls from living to their potential and in the life that Jesus has so freely given to us. I pray, dear Father, the unsaved begins to bear fruit right now. That this thing <clears throat> that seems so distant and so unknown to them, that as you begin to deal with them, Father God, that they'll have understanding, that they'll freely give their hearts and their lives to you. God, I ask you to give us more compassion for those that don't know you. Help us to always remember to pray for the lost. Amen. And Father God, we pray for our nation and for its healing. We come before you this day and pray for the health of our nation. But the healing of our land begins with the healing of our hearts. Sin and wickedness in our nation has been a direct effect on our health as a nation. We are in need of your divine healing. Your word tells us that if we humble ourselves and pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways, you will forgive us 
of our sins and heal our land. Like a cancerous infection, sin has spread through our culture. My prayer today is for people of faith to intentionally humble themselves and pray and seek your face. Our hearts have been blinded by prejudice, immorality, and dishonesty. We have allowed self-interest, pride, and misplaced priorities to pull us away from your truth. Our enemy is not our fellow Americans or those that plot to destroy our country. It is Satan who stirs up hatred and division. He is out to destroy the lives and families in our country's leadership. I declare it is time that we take back what the enemy has stole from us. Our United States Pledge of Allegiance says that we are one nation under God. Our motto of the United States is, in God we trust. The Constitution of the United States was influenced by Christian morals and values. Lord God, we need your wisdom. You have given us a great country, founded on truths from your word. You alone hold the power to heal our nation. Turn the hearts of our leaders, Lord, and you hear our hearts when we pray to heal our land. Help us to forever be faithful to care and pursue our hearts in prayer. And in your name we give you thanks. Amen. Church. Wow, that's a hard prayer to follow. <laughs> father, you are a good father. And um, we, we that are created in your image, we are sanctified. And that means that we are holy. We are inherently born special we're born above the birds and the trees and the flowers and the animals and we just repent for the lack of value of human life in this nation if in fact we saw people as Jesus sees people there would be no war there would be no thieving, there would be no stealing, there would be no murder. It is the, the collapse of our moral character as a country that we have the problems that we do, that we have left the door open for Satan to come on in and deceive and perverse what your word says. We are bought with a price. We are special. Your word says we are different. We are made in your image. And, Father, we just, we repent for what we do to the unborn, for the lack of value that we put on those lives, for the lack of value we put on the people who have physical handicaps, for the lack of value that we put on our elderly. I just pray that we could just reinstate the, the word, the honor of your word, the honor of what you say. I just pray that our nation, I, for, I pray for repentance over our nation, for the blood that has spilled and stained our soil. We can't necessarily help what the world is doing. We need to start with our own yard. So, Father, I just ask that you give parents the wisdom and the power to start teaching their children the value that God has for us and each other. And I pray that our elected officials will uphold those, that moral fiber, the character and the ethics that your word says we should have. And I pray that we would just adhere to the commandment to love 
our neighbors as we love ourselves because we are in the image of you. We honor you, and by honoring you, we honor every single person regardless of their race, regardless of their age, regardless of their religious beliefs, though we, we seek for them to come to Jesus because we know that he wants none to perish. And if we would simply begin with the value of life, I think that things would change. And we just pray these things. We just pray that you move our hearts and the hearts of everyone in this country to come back and be the force, the country that you started us out to be. And what a change in the world that will bring. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. I'm praying for revival, renewal, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Covenant Life Church of God. Words contain images when we hear a word. Our minds bring forth memories, and we know what the word means based on our experiences. Most words have a greater depth of meaning than our concepts convey. Revival is a noun derived from the word revive. Thus, the direct power of the concept is in the verb. While Webster's Dictionary has many definitions for the word revive, I have chosen only two. One, to bring back to life. Two, to bring back to a healthy, vigorous, or flourishing condition after a decline. I'm using the same approach with the word renew. To make new, make fresh, young, or strong again. Two, to give new spiritual strength to someone or something. Isaiah 40, 28 and 31 speak of this. The creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You may be tempted to think that the word wait indicates a passive condition. According to Strong's concordance, this is incorrect for this passage. Strong's translation of the Hebrew is, the word wait stresses the straining of the mind in a certain direction, with an expectant attitude, a forward look with assurance. The bottom line is, it's up to us. Uh, this morning, this was newly in the vestibule, and I read it, and it's like, I need to incorporate this. Because St. Paul has voiced the same thing in Philippians 3, 12 through 16 in the Passion Translation. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past and hasten my heart to the future instead. I ran straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize, following one path with one passion. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can approach your throne of grace through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We thank you for pro providing all that we need 
We thank you for giving us a hope and a future. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, our counselor and friend. We thank you for Jesus. We praise you, creator of the universe, who knows our hearts and even the number of hairs on our heads. You are a good, good daddy. You are awesome. Heavenly Father, we cry out to you as we push forward and strain to know you more completely. As the depth of our relationship grows, we seek to fulfill Jesus' first and great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. We face our weakness, and we know that we cannot do this on our own. Jesus told us, ask, and it will be given to you in Luke, and ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be for, in, full in John. Father, we know that you give good gifts to your children, and we ask for a greater measure of your Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire that will bring us back to vibrant faith. We ask that your resurrection power that rose Jesus from the dead will manifest in our lives, filling us with overwhelming joy and charisma that will attract those who have lost their way. We cry out for those who have strayed and those who do not yet know you. We trust that Holy Spirit has a plan and he will bring us into contact with the ones he has chosen for us, for here and for now. We pray in the name above all names, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your presence here this morning. I thank you, Lord, that in your presence is an open door to come before you, Lord Jesus to petition you, and to praise you, and to glorify you, Lord, for your presence. And I thank you, Lord, that you hear us when we pray. And Lord, I pray right now for our pastor. Lord, that with the anointing that's upon your word will be upon him, Lord Jesus, and the wisdom that comes through the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. For he is our pastor. Lord, we need him in good health, Lord Jesus, to minister us as our shepherd to feed us the flock of his pasture, Lord Jesus, and of your pasture. Lord, you are the head of the church, and Lord Jesus, he is head of us. Lord, and we just glorify you right now, Lord, for the anointing that flows from you. Lord, we praise and glorify you, Lord Jesus, for without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, we know that you hear us, and I thank you that we do hear us, and that you do give us the desires of our heart as we glorify you, Lord Jesus, in this service this morning. I praise your name. Amen. Lord, tune me, your instrument, your instrument of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Lord, tune me, your instrument, your instrument of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Lord, play me, your instrument, your instrument of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Play me your instrument, your instrument of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Lord, make us a symphony 
a symphony of worship. We lift up our hands in your name. Lord, make us a symphony, a symphony of worship. We lift up our hands in your name. Lord, play now a love song, love song to Jesus. I lift up my hands in your name. Play now a love song, a love song of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Make me an instrument, Lord. Make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Lord, play now that love song. Play now a love song. Love song of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. Play A love song of worship. I lift up my hands in your name. I lift up my hands in your name. Thank you, Jesus, for the your neighbors around you and welcome them this morning and tell them let's get ready because pastor's got a good word for us. <clears throat> and now I'll introduce that word, waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. I think it's a very important and timely word today that the Lord has for us. Up, up front, I need to tell you that waiting on the Lord does not mean being idle. 
The only way that is true is by what I heard years ago when I was working as a young man on a railroad section gang. Anybody know what that is? You don't want to know, believe me. My boss would often tell us to, hurry up and wait, boys. <laughs> I know that sounds strange, but it was his way of saying, let's get on with the job so we can get through and go home. <laughs> you know, we, we can wait to do important things, but waiting on the Lord can't wait can't wait. Waiting is not a sit-down job with a lot of idle time. It is a very demanding venture to truly wait upon the Lord. It is about being all in at whatever is before you, no matter the cost. And there is a high price to pay sometimes. It is all about pleasing the Lord in all that you do and in all that you say. Sometimes what we say is a whole lot more than what we do. I, I think I need to say that again. Sometimes what we say is a whole lot more than what we do. It is all about serving the interest of God's kingdom in the earth first and foremost. And, and being at His beck and call. The difference between being a winner and loser in life and work may very well be in our attitude at the beginning of of and all through the journey. Now, so that you don't miss that, I'm going to grind it on you one more time, okay? <laughs> the difference between being a winner and a loser in life and work may very well be in our attitude at the beginning and all through the journey of what we deal with in this life. Perhaps the best example of waiting on the Lord is that of a waiter in a restaurant. <clears throat> he or she is there to serve the needs of patrons. They're not there to be seen or heard. They're there to say it, serve. They wait on the customer, serving them with drink, food, and whatever else is required. As believers, we must learn and practice the greater lesson of waiting upon the Lord. Many souls, souls that are lost in sin and needing to find a way to God, are hanging in the balance right now. Many people. Some of them as close as possibly a stone's throw. Some of them are our neighbors. Some of them are our family. There are people out there who need God that we know about. Some of them we pray for. We should seek to know more of them and influence their lives. Their eternal salvation is dependent on our waiting on them. The Amplified Version of the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20 says this and says it so beautifully. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that, and that you are not your own, and I added this word, property. You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased 
with the precious blood of Jesus and made His own. So then honor and glorify God with your body. That, that uh, phrase, is, all of that is taken from the Amplified Version of the Bible. So again, waiting on the Lord is more important than sitting, looking, or even doing. Waiting on the Lord is what is key. The first first thing I want to say is that waiting on the Lord is learning how to be still and listening to hear the voice of God calling us to Himself. Learning Learning to be still, well, let's put it this way. If a hunter goes into the woods with his gun to get some game, he doesn't go in there stomping around, yelling to the top of his lungs. (laughs) If his wife's a good hunter, she knows how to hunt. Maybe the husband shouldn't take her along anymore. Amen. <laughs> Where was I at? <laughs> it is so important for us to understand how we have to deal with the kinds of things that believers deal with in helping others to find Jesus. The voice of God calls us to Himself, calls us to His purpose, to His way. The voice of God is calling us right now. I don't hear it, Pastor. Yeah, you do. I just spoke it to you. You hear it. You know He's calling. The second thing I want to say to you is the Bible says in Psalms 46 and 10, Be still. Everybody say, Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We spend so much time bothered by what's out there and trying to achieve it or accomplish it when if we would just simply first be still. Be still we will find God in the stillness. The next thing I want to say is that waiting on the Lord is tuning out every other voice but His voice and moving at His commands only. There are a lot of voices out there today speaking into our lives. A lot of voices speaking into our, you watch TV, somebody's going to speak something into your life. You gather with a group of other people to, to eat in a restaurant, let's say, somebody's going to speak something into your life. And if you're not careful, you'll hear something that is the wrong thing to focus on. Be still, the scripture says. Be still and know that I am God. Don't clamor and hunt and move at the whim of every little spoken word. Weigh it carefully. Weigh it scripturally. And see what God really is saying. Waiting on the Lord is tuning out every other voice but His voice and moving at His command only. Waiting on the Lord is joining the battle He calls us to wage and being a warrior in the fight. Say, Pastor, you expect me to duke it out with somebody? Yeah, the devil. (laughs) People are not your enemy. It's the devil who is your enemy. If you want to get angry with someone, get angry with the devil. God has given us the power through the name of Jesus to put him in his place and get him out of our way. Join the battle 
that he calls you to wage and be a warrior in the fight. It's being ready at his command to move into action and willing to pay whatever price is necessary to fulfill his commandments and instructions. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to take action? Are you ready to pay whatever price is necessary? Are you ready to fulfill his commandments no matter what the cost? The Bible says his commandments are not grief striking. They are soul encouraging and life changing. They'll change your life. They'll change the life of that neighbor who irritates the fire out of you. They will change people who you just didn't think could be changed. All you have to do is speak them into their life, pray for them, and God will do the work that needs to be done. Well, Pastor, I've been at this a long time. Well, don't give up now. You might be about that close to victory. Amen? Be ready at God's command to move into action. That, that waiting process gets interrupted sometime when God says, Okay, it's time. Time to get up and pray for your neighbor. It's time to get up and pray for your family. It is time for you to do a personal witness to someone. It's time for you to do something good so it opens the door to do something even better. you got to be willing to pay whatever price is necessary to fulfill God's commandments and instructions. But you know, in doing all that, all during the process, you get to enjoy the company of his presence. You, you get to enjoy the company of his presence. And I'm just going to toss this in there. It's not in my notes, but it's in my mind. And I just got to say it. Sometimes the conception we have of the presence of God is totally off. We think of him more as a God of judgment than we do as a God of mercy. Here's the deal, folks. If it wasn't for mercy, I'd have been gone a long time ago. And yes, I'm going to say it. If it wasn't for mercy, you'd have been gone a long time ago. Waiting on the Lord is the joy of those who seek after Him. Waiting on the Lord is the joy of those who seek after Him. I'll just tell you right now, there is nobody on the face of this earth who can do what He can do. And the joy of waiting on Him to do it, just sometimes, I'm going to use this word, I don't know why, but I'm going to use it. It's hilarious. It is so fun to watch him work and see the fruit of his presence and power in the lives of others whose lives are changing, whose hearts are being touched, and their whole approach to life is being reformed, reshaped, and they're driven by his presence. Waiting on the Lord is the joy of those who seek after Him. They're always tuned in to hear His every word and ready to obey whatever He says. Okay, it don't say closing, but this is where we're at. We're at closing. Waiting on the Lord means not getting ahead of Him. Staying in step with Him. Moving with Him when He moves. 
standing with him when he stands. Some people are so full of movement, they miss him when he moves and can't understand why he has left them. Because they are moving and not waiting on him to move. They're doing what they think is right and missing what he's trying to tell them is right. In fact, he, he doesn't leave people when that happens, what I just described. They left him. Oh, oh, a little idea here, Pastor. They, God doesn't leave people. If the presence of God left you, you'd be gone just like that, swallowed up into eternity. Even, even the sinner is on the mind and heart of God, and God watches over them, waiting, waiting so he can send somebody in their path that will help them understand how they can live for eternity, not just time. Many people are not still long enough to discern the wisdom of God's direction. Therefore, they miss it and they flounder to find their way again to his will. They they just grope their way through. There are those believers who are so busy with what they think to be his will and wisdom that they run right past him and where he is working. I, I want to go back and read that statement again. There are those believers who are so busy with what they think to be his will and wisdom that they run right past him and where he is working. I, I know it's none of us in here today. None of us. It was Job that gave the following testimony about God's ways and his own personal need to slow down, tune in, and focus on him for personal learning to take place. Job is a great example of waiting on the Lord. Here is a testimony of what he said about that in chapter 23, verses 8 through 12 of the book named after him in the Old Testament. It says, look, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he is unique, and who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore, brace yourself, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. We are taught in God's word to fear God and keep his commandments. For God made my heart weak, Job said, and the Almighty terrifies me, because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness, and he did not hide deep darkness from my face. Job's life 
is one of the most interesting character studies in the Old Testament, maybe in the Bible. In what Job went through, there is so much learning and growth material that there's not a one of us in this house, and I dare say not a one of us, in Lake County, the state of Florida, the whole world, and especially the United States of America, we could benefit, all of us, from reading and applying the book of Job. I'm, I'm reminded of something I heard years ago about a guy trying to impress someone about his biblical knowledge, and, and he said, I love the Bible. I especially love that book of Job. I love it. I wonder if that's our car. The interruption of a car horn. It's real, isn't it? Okay. It'll quit after a while. <laughs> there we go. Okay, here's the end of it right here. Everybody say hallelujah. So when the time comes that you can't go forward and you can't go backward, remember this. It must be time to stand still. To see what God is going to do. Just stand still and see what God is going to do. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to manipulate God. Just stand still. Watch for the salvation of God in the midst of the calamity and the confusion. God is good at that kind of thing, you know. He can do things that you and I could never do. We need to hold on to this truth that waiting on the Lord is the most profitable, the most reliable, the most certain exercise we can practice that leads us on to life as He, God, prescribes it. Wait on the Lord. Wait, wait on the Lord and He will strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord and you're going to miss a lot of calamity. Wait on the Lord and you'll get through this life. It is when we think we know and begin to pursue our own path with no regard for Him that we run headlong into trouble and a lot of dead ends. We keep getting in there and we have to back our way out. Go press door number three or four. Or... I want to leave you with these words in Job 23 and 10. Job said this. He was miserable. He had these sores all over his body. There was no one to doctor him, so he found an old piece of pottery and just began to scrape what he could. He had worn himself out mentally trying to figure out what's going on. He needed help, but nobody... 
Nobody cared enough to extend a hand. Here's what he said. In the face of all that, sitting in the ash heap, here's what he said. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth and go. God may not be through testing you yet, but it's okay. Because one day he will be. And when he is, you're going to be gold. Just look at your neighbor and tell them that. You're going to be gold. Now, don't, don't get worried or anything like that because probably not anything like the kind of gold we know about. It's comforting to me to know there is an end to all this misery and suffering. There is an end to this world of sin and all the problems that sin creates in the lives of people that I love dearly, care about passionately. Sin is a real problem, but Jesus Christ died for our sins. And he can cure the sin problem that sin creates in us. All we have to do is trust him. Would you bow your head with me? Father, I am very grateful to you for the word that has gone forth today. Thank you, Lord, for giving it to me in my Bible. Thank you for opening my mind to the things that I've shared today. Thank you for this congregation being here today to hear, to listen. Now help us, Father, every one of us, myself at the head of the class, to go forth and put this word into practice in my own life. I want to get better. I need to get better. And by the grace of God, and my obedience to you, I will get better. Father, I'm trusting you for every person in this house and trusting you with them to do in their hearts and in their lives, in their physical being, what they need done, what they desire to have done. May your blessing go with us all the way, even to the end of of the age we are a part of and on into eternity forever and forever in Jesus name I want you to bow your heads with me and keep them bowed a moment just feel impressed to pray again but I want to ask you before I pray if there is some special need in your life would, would you just signify it by raising your hand putting it right back down just just do that for me. Just raise it up, put it right back down. Don't, don't be afraid. It may not be so terribly critical, but it's just a nagging little thing that nags at your mind. So would you join hands with people right close to you there if you can reach them? If not, just kind of reach out your hand toward them and Let's pray one more time. Father, I am so grateful to you that every person who raised their hand was here today because I'm believing in this prayer that some powerful change is going to come. That you are going to enter into their problems, their difficulties, their struggles, their sicknesses the barriers that keep them bound. You are going to enter into those things and touch them, releasing them, Lord, from them. In the name of Jesus, thank you 
that you are Lord of all. There is nothing beyond the power of your hand except those who do not come to you confessing their need of you. And today we do, we have, we will. We need you, Father. We need you. We need you to be a father to us. We need a savior. We need a healer. We need a provider. And we trust you, Lord. That provision has come through Jesus Christ, your son. Through the power of your hand extended, Father. Provision has come. Now we're expecting and believing that things are going to be different this week. What has been is not going to be anymore. What needs to be is going to be, Father. Because you are God, you are Lord Jesus, and we praise you for your blessing and presence in our lives. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for every person here, most of all for your presence here. Touch us as we go now and help us to be your emissaries to our communities of residence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you as you go and go in His name. Amen.